Hello and welcome to the Johnny Danger Show. I'm Johnny Danger coming to you live from the Danger Zone. And today we bring you another episode of Saturday Afternoon Podcast, or Saturday Morning, Saturday Afternoon Audiobooks, uh, featuring John Gray's Straw Dogs, Thoughts on Humans and Other Animals. That being said, we've been going through the thought process and philosophies of the earlier... um, Socratic theologists, not theologists, uh, psychoanalysts. Um, I don't know. They, they talk about Marx at some point, Socrates, uh, some other human um, human thought um, people. It, this is a complex book. I'm not going to lie. I'm forcing myself through it because I started something. We're going to finish it. Uh, that being said, we're on chapter 11. Uh, There is a bounce between uh, chapters last because we ended up deleting the last video. That's okay. I get too 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 in my head about these videos, and I I freak out and delete some of them. So unfortunately, chapters I think four through ten probably don't exist anymore. That being said, we're gonna push on. We're gonna finish this book if it's the last thing I do. That being said, uh, it's not chapter 11, it's chapter 2, part 11, Lord's Jim's Jump. As I said before, I'm going to try to limit my commentary, but I do have a lot to think to say about this. All right, here we go. In his novel, Lord Film, Joseph Conrad writes, of the son of an English person who is charmed by a heroic vision of life as a seaman, Oh, we read this already. Didn't we? He takes up a seafaring life only to be disillusioned, entering the regions so well known to his imagination. He found them strangely barren of adventure, yet he does not go back, but goes on with his life at sea. In his mid-twenties, he enlists as first mate on the Patma, I remember this story. We read this already. All right, we'll just, we'll take it from here. Uh, At the Patma, a bartered old steamer en route to Mecca with a human cargo of 800 pilgrims. The Patna hits a submerged obstacle and seems to sink, leaving the pilgrims to their fate. The ship's German captain, the European officer, take to the lifeboat they have lowered alongside at first Jim does nothing viewing the event almost as a spectator but finally he jumps and finds himself on that lifeboat on the lifeboat I had jumped he checked himself averted his gaze it seems he added as it turns out the Patna is unharmed and the Muslim passengers are safely towed to the harbor But Jim's life has changed forever. The ship's captain disappears. And Jim has to face the disgrace of public inquiry alone. In private. He is haunted by the feeling that he has betrayed the seaman's ethic of bravery and service. In the years that follow, he seeks anonymity and perpetual travel. He ends up at Patusan a remote settlement of northwest Sumatra, where he finds sanctuary from the world and becomes Tuan Jim, Lord Jim, the ruler who brings peace to the native people. But events and his own character conspired against him. Patasan is is invaded by a maligned buccaneer, Gentleman Brown, and his gang, Jim arranges for Brown to leave the island, but the pirate murderers Jim, Jim's friends. The son of the elderly native chieftain. I could have read that better. Bear with me. Jim arranges for Brown to leave the island, and but the pirate murders Jim's friend, the son of the elderly native chieftain. Jim has pledged his life to the safety of the inhabitants of Patterson. He honors the pl- and he honors the pledge by going to the grieving chieftain who shoots him dead 
one. Lord Jim's life is overshadowed by, qu by a question he cannot answer. Did he jump or was he pushed by events? The idea that he will, we are authors of our actions is required by morality. If Jim is not to be held accountable for his jump, he must have been able to act otherwise than he did. That is what free will means. If it means anything, Jim, did Jim do what he did freely, or can he or anyone else ever know? See, I want to stop right there really quickly just to discuss that, right? So he, he unpack that. So it's essentially the, the comparison that he's making is that this person, Lord Jim, or the the main character protagonist that they're discussing about acted the first time as if by impulse like he didn't he wasn't able he, was, he wasn't the chief the captain of his own ship at that point in time no pun intended essentially the situation brought him to his conclusion which was to run away in fear of his own life Understandably, this is a situation that you can see yourself in, right? You're the first time at sea, something bad happens, fight or flight comes in, and your impulse is to run. That's flight, right? You can't control that. So this is what they're saying: is that it's either that your option of automatically doing things because of your your subconscious impulse, or you can act rationally the way he did, and when he was protecting his uh his inhabitants and get shot by your own people either way one you'll survive one you won't is what it essentially is the is the, the what this story i believe is trying to tell you so let's just keep reading did jim do what he did freely how can he or anyone else ever know bear with me did jim do that freely or how can he or anyone else ever know like, what, what's, what is this? Why is this hyphenated? Whatever, let's go. Um, there are many reasons for rejecting the idea for free will. Some of them decisive. If our actions are caused, then we cannot have, act otherwise than we do. In, the act, in that case, we cannot be responsible for them. We cannot be free agents only if we are authors of our acts. But we are ourselves products of, chain, of chance and necessity. We cannot choose to be what we are born. In that case, we cannot be responsible for what we do. These are strong arguments against free will, but recent scientific research has weakened it even more. In the Benjamin Betts work on the half second delay, it has been shown that the electrical impulse, so I remember reading this, I'm just gonna read it, sorry. Impulse that in initiates action occurs half a second before we take the con the conscious decision to act we think our we think of ourselves as deliber deliberating what to do then doing it in fact we it nearly the whole whole of our lives our actions are initiated unconsciously and the brain makes us ready for action then we have the experience of acting as Labette and his colleagues put it Okay, so what he's saying is there's another study that um, sh proves that sometimes you record things even faster at a subconscious level, even better than you do consciously. So I get it. I get it. I, I think what he's trying to say is that just act on your own instinct and, and hope for the best because that's all you can hope for, I guess. I'm hoping that's what he's trying to say, but let's keep going. Let's reading. Let's keep reading. The brain evidently decides to initiate or at least prepare to initiate the act at the time before there is any reputable subject aware subjective awareness that such a decision has taken place. Cerebr cerebral initiation, even the spontaneous voluntary act, can and usually does begin unconsciously. If we do not act in the way that we think we do, the reason is partly due to do with the bandwidth of consciousness. We got low latency, fellas. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> you know, you gotta upgrade. <laughs> He's trying to say we're stupid. It's ability to transmit, to transmit measured in terms of bits per second. This is much too narrow. Imagine we can create a computer that can do that. They can't. Computers, I feel like, can process way more information than we can. Not yet. 
Maybe, with, well, maybe, I don't know. I don't know, we'll see. Its ability to transmit information measured to terms and bits per second. This too much. This is too narrow to be able to register the information we routinely, routinely receive and act on. As an organism active in the world, we process perhaps 14 million bits per second of information. The bandwidth is consciousness is around us around 18 bits. This means that we have to conscious we have conscious access to about a millionth of the information we daily use to survive. So that's probably that 10% that we keep talking about. The upshot of neuroscientific research is that we cannot be the authors of our acts. Lebec does ret retain the faint shadow of free will um, in his notion of the veto. The capacity of consciousness to stall or abort an act that the brain has initiated. The trouble is that we can never know when or if we have exercised the veto. So it's saying that the brain or the consciousness or our subconsciousness acts and our conscious brain decides whether it says presses the brakes so what does that mean there's cases where I want to run away but like I'm my conscious brain is saying no I'm fighting our subjective experience is frequent is frequently perhaps always ambiguous when we are at, on the point of acting we cannot predict what we're about to do yet when we look back on our, uh, our when we Yet when we look back, when we, we may see our decision as a step on the path on which we were already bound. We see our thoughts sometimes as events that happen to us, and sometimes as, as our acts. Our feeling of freedom comes about through switching between these two angles of vision, free, free will and trick of perceptive perspective. Free will or is... He's saying, excuse me, free will is a trick of the pers of perspective. So because you, that, I'm guessing because that veto occurs, it, it tricks us as to thinking that we had actually any, um, this music. As, as I called to its attention. So essentially what it's saying, it's like, because we can stop ourselves from acting on impulse, it tricks us into thinking that we actually have the ability to stop ourselves. But doesn't that mean we have the ability to stop ourselves? I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's times where we don't act on our pure impulses. I think more often than not, When we are on the point of acting, we cannot predict what we are about to do. Yet, when we look back and we, we just read that, stuck in an incessant oscillation between the perspective of an actor and the and that of a spectator, Lord Jim is unable to decide what he has done. He hopes to dredge from consciousness that sometime that will end his uncertainty. He is in search of his own character. It is a vain search, for as Schopenhauer, the author much read by Conrad, had written, whatever identity we may possess is only very dimly accessible to the conscious awareness. It is assumed that the identity of persons... Sorry, my background is hectic. I'm trying to focus at the same time. Uh, um, if, however, we understand by this merely the conscious re recollection of the course of life, then it is enough. Not enough. We know it is true. Something more th of the the course of our life than the no of a novel we have formerly read. Yet very little indeed. The principal events, the interesting scenes, have been impre impressed on us for the rest. A thousand events are forgotten for one that has been retained. 
The older we become, the more does everything pass us by without a trace. It is true that, in consequence of our relation to the external world, we are accustomed to regard the subject of knowing. The knowing I as our real self, this, however, is the mere function of the brain and is not our real self. Our true self, the kernel of our inner nature, is that which is to be found behind this, and which on, which really only knows nothing but willing and not willing. The not knowing cannot find the acting self for which it seeks. The un, 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 all, the unalterable character with which with which Schopenhauer sometimes Conrad believes all humans are born may not exist, but we cannot help looking within ourselves to account for what we do. All we find is fragments like memories of, of a novel we once read. Lord Jim can never know why he jumped. That is his fate. As a result, he can never start his life afresh with a clean slate. The last word on J Lord Jim, Jim's jump must have been given to Marlowe. The, shre the shrewd and sympathetic narrator of the tale who, who writes, As to me, left alone with the solitary candle, I remained singularly enlightened. I was no longer young enough to behold at every turn the magnificence that besets our insignificant footsteps in good and evil. I smile to think that, after all, it was yet he, of us too, who had not light, who had not, who had the light, and felt sad. A clean slate, did he say? As the initial word, I'm losing patience with the sentence. Uh, as the initial word of the each our destiny were not graven to imperishable characters on the face of the ro a rock. I I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. He, if you, if that was a uh, mic drop, I I wasn't able to follow it. I, I'm sorry. As to me left alone with a solitary candle, I remained singularly enlightened, unenlightened. I was so longer young enough to behold at every turn the magnificence of that beset our insignificant footsteps. There's just a lot of big words, I think. It's saying that we, we, can never, we, we can't go back. Paraphrase. Can I paraphrase? I'm losing my patience with this book. All right. Chapter two, part 12. Our virtual selves. Hey, we all have our virtual selves. Okay. It, it gets me at some point, but then it loses me on other points. But maybe that's just the way the book is, or thought experiments are supposed to be. Why didn't my fan stop working? Oh, because it disconnected. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? How dare Greta Thunberg steal my catchphrase? That used to be my catchphrase. How dare you? Our virtual selves. <laughs> we think our actions express our decisions, but in nearly all, all of our life, willing decides nothing. We cannot wake up for all asleep for, uh, or fall asleep. Remember or forgot our dreams. I'm trying, guys. Maybe I should take an Adderall before. No, I do. Uh, all medication should only be pres um, taken while prescribed. Okay. But in nearly all of our life, willing, de willing decides nothing. Willing. Like, meaning... The, what you want decides nothing we cannot wake up or fall asleep remember or forget our dreams summon or banish our thoughts by deciding to do so when we greet someone on the street we just act and there is no actor standing behind what we do our acts are the end points of, in long se se sequences of unconscious responses they arise from the structure of habits and skills that is almost infinitely complicated. Most of our life is enacted without conscious awareness, nor can it be made conscious, nor 
degree of self-awareness can make up make us self apparent transparent Freud is this Freud or Freud Freud believed that by bringing repressed memories into conscious awareness we can gain greater control of our lives so long as they remain in inaccessible we may be puzzled by attacks in, of anxiety or beset by recurrent slips of the tongue yeah that's absolutely true past trauma definitely dictates a, a lot of the responses that we and like subconscious responses that we have so long as they remain a certain uh, or beset um by airliner says oh. hi hello i want to offer promotion of your channel <laughs> viewers followers oh. views that's chat so nice. bots the price is lower than any competitor what? the quality is guaranteed to be the best okay auto on incredibly flexible and convenient order management panel everything is in your hands right. turn it on slash off slash customize okay go to dogehype.com thank you i wish i had my round of applause thing sponsored by dogehype.com now let's continue that was actually a paid sponsorship believe it or not dogehype.com Get get your f f uh, fake uh, clout here today at Doge Cap. Doge Cap. When we greet someone on the street, we just act, and there's no actor standing behind what we do. Our acts are endpoints in long sequences of unconscious responses. They arise from the structure of habits and still and skills that is almost infinitely complicated. Most of our life is enacted without conscious awareness, nor can it be made conscious. Nor de no degree of self-awareness can make us self-transparent. Oh, that's that's cold. Damn. No degree of self-awareness can make you self-transparent, meaning completely aware of everything about what the, your responses are. Ah, uh, that's. Isn't that Nirvana? <laughs> Isn't that what that means? Um, Freud believed that by bringing repressed memories into conscious awareness, we can gain greater control over our lives. So as long as we remain inaccessible, we may be puzzled by attacks of anxiety, by beset by. Rec I know I just read this, but whatever. But or beset by recurrent slips of the tongue, retrieving the memories that lie behind such compulsive behavior may may enable us to alter it. Freud understood that much of the life of the mind goes on in the absence of the consciousness. Perhaps he was right that bringing back the conscious awareness, the, bringing back to conscious awareness those of our thoughts that are unconscious because we have repressed them can enable us to cope with better, a life better. But the preconscious mental activities that lie behind everyday perception and behavior cannot be retrieved in the in this way. Unlike unconscious mind of which Freud, Freud, Freud speaks, they are what makes conscious awareness possible. Our conscious selves arise from processes in which conscious awareness plays only a small part. We resist the, this fact because it seems to deprive us of the, of the control of control of our lives. We think of our actions as the end result of our thoughts, yet much of the greater part of everyone's life goes without thinking. The sense of conscious, conscious agency may be an artifact of conflict among people of our among our impulses. When we know what we do, are are hardly conscious of doing it. That does not mean we are ruled by instinct or habit. It means we spend our lives coping with what comes along. Damn, that's brutal. So it's just like you're living, you're living, you're living. A situation arises, your fight, flight, or fight, flight, or whatever response uh, happens, you. It happens. You have no. You have no control over what happens at this point because it's it's autopilot, and 
It's like that movie, um, what was that movie? Oh, I own this movie and I don't know what it's called. Upgrade? Is it Upgrade? Where it just automatically, you know, he's just fighting this guy, an autopilot, so it's, it's like that. And then all we can do from, from the, the time of the traumatic event that happened and what we responded to is cope with the fact that, that it happened to us and that's how we responded, which is true. But yeah, I mean, that all that does is just frees us from the responsibility of like, oh, I wish I would have done this. No, well, there's, there's nothing you could have done because you were in that situation, right? It's a fucked up situation and nothing can cure that fact that somebody did something pathetically intolerable to you and you have to deal with that consequence that's the part that you have to deal with not the fact that you how you acted because you have no inevitable inevitably you have no control all right let's keep going we deal with the uh, the death of a friend in much the same way we step aside to avoid a failing still slate we may be in debt in doubt as to how to show our sadness or comfort uh, uh, others who have been bereaved bere bereaved have been bereaved we gotta look this up bereaved bereaved but it we if we succeed in doing so it is not because we have altered our beliefs or improved our reasonings. It is because we have learned to cope with things more unskillfully. We see ourselves as unitary conscious subjects and our lives as the sum of their doings. Recent cognitive science and ancient Buddhist teachings are at one of viewing, one in viewing this ordinary sense of self as elusive. Both view selfhood in humans as a highly complex and fragmentary thing. Francisco Varela, a cognitive scientist who has noted uh, the convergence. Sorry, my back's killing me. Let me just fix it really quick. Let me read this one. Scientists who noted con convergence of recent scientific inquiry of Buddhist teachings have formu formulated the view of the self. Oh, and I just realized, did I not switch what I was doing on Twitch? Such a... No, yeah, everybody thinks I'm playing Cyberpunk 2077. That's awesome. okay okay let's keep going um views of self um have in common our micro roles and micro identities to do to not come all stuck together on what in one solid in one solid centralized unitary self but rather arise and subside in the succession of shifting patterns in buddhist technology there this is the doctrine whose truth can be verified by direct observation that the self is empty in of self nature void of any graspable substantially since substantiality cognitive science follows buddhist teachings in viewing the self as a shimmera our perceptions are fragments picked out from the unfathomable riches but here is no one doing the selecting ourselves are f themselves fragmentary contrary to what seems to be the case from a cursory introspection 
Cognition does not flow seam seamlessly on one state to another, but rather consists in the in a punctuated succession of behavioral patterns that arise the subside and measurable time. This insight of recent neuroscience and the cognitive science in general is fundamental, for it relieves us from the tyranny of searching for a centralized homuncular quality to account for a cognitive agent's normal behavior. The notion that our lives are guided by the homunculus in an, an inner person detecting our behavior, directing our behavior, arises from our ability to view ourselves from the outside. We project a self onto our actions because by doing so, we cannot account for the way they seem to hang together. The continuities we find are frequently Im imaginary, but when they are real, it is not because anyone put them there. Our behavior displays a good deal of order, but it does not come about though any inner person order ordering it as R.A. Brooks writes. Just as there's no central representation, there's no central system. Each activity connects perception to the act directly, to the action directly. It is only the observer of the creature who imputes a central representation of central control. The creature itself has none. It is a collection of competing behaviors. Out of the local chaos of their in interactions, there emerges, in the eye of the observer, coherent pattern of behavior. Okay, it's just still saying it. We're auto, auto, auto pre programmed to act the way we're supposed to want to act. Fair enough. This account of robot behavior. <laughs> robot behavior by a contemporary theorist of an artificial intelligence applies no less to humans we are possessed by the notion that there are there must be a central con controller when the tr in truth there are only the shifting scenario sceneries shifting sceneries of perception and behavior that's true because we have a conscious mind and subconscious mind so essentially there's a um uh do a duality in everybody right and we acknowledge that in like stories like jekyll and hyde and and um you know bipolarism it's probably an, an exaggerated version of the duality all right let's keep going sorry guys i'm trying to write, read right through this selfhood in humans is not an expression of any essential unity it is a pattern of organization not unlike that found in insect colonies around 80 years ago the south african poet the naturalist eugene Maurice published the soul of the white ant a path-breaking study of the life of termites in it it gave us his reasoning for thinking that ants have a soul or, or psyche but one that is communal the soul of the of the white ant is not the property of any individual insect but the of the entire nest of the termitary or the termitary at the time this is what revolutionary results but at the time this was a revolutionary result but it was been it has been confirmed by a later research it has been confirmed by later research and eliminating experiment the removal of highly efficient insect nurses from the colony led them to forage more than nurse less while the main colony less efficient nurses nursed more when the efficient nurses returned to the main colony they returned to their previous activities what it what is particularly striking about the insect colony is that we readily admit that its separate components are individuals and that it has no century of localized self. Yet the whole does not behalf, behave as a unity and as if there were a coordinating agent present as its entire as its century. I'm not 100% understanding what they're saying, but we'll keep going. How much time do I have left? Oh, I got a minute. 
One in 20 seconds. All right, perfect. And we're getting to the end of this chapter. We have two colonies, um, find ourselves, Viral um, puts it, as a selfless or virtu virtual self. The coherent global pattern that emerges from the activity of simple local components, which seems to be a centralized located, um, but is nowhere to be found in humans. As the insect colony's perception of action go on as if there were a self that directs them when the fact none exists, the labor under an error, we act in the belief that we are all in one piece, but we are able to cope with things only because we are a succession of fragments. We cannot shake off the sense that we are enduring selves, and yet we know not. All right. So that concludes uh, chapter two, part 12. Uh, next chapter is going to, or next part, we're going to be going into chapter two part 13 so that's going to be an interesting um number to start back up on so maybe we can start doing this more often because this book is dragging along at a snail's pace but i'm actually enjoying it i can't wait to get to the end of it and that's my timer to get going all right so thanks for watching if you have been watching special thanks to doge dogehype.com <laughs> for sponsoring today's episode uh catch you next sunday around noon I usually start at noon. I started earlier today. Sorry. You guys got the pre-recorded stuff after. Um, but thanks for watching. If you have been watching, and as always, peace.